Welcome everyone. My name is Katherine Urich and I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, or CNAS for short, at UC Riverside. Before we get started with the science lecture series, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Kauia, Tongva, Lusanyo, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are very grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. I would also like to thank you for joining us for the third and final science lecture series this year on COVID conversations, how the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UC Riverside is combating the pandemic of our lifetime. This year's science lecture series was a three-part series with CNAS scientists who responded to the pandemic by creating a testing lab on campus for students, conducting research in virology to understand viruses and vaccine development, and investigating the assembly and reproduction of the coronavirus in the human body. The first presentation with Professor Catherine Berkovich and Professor Iskwi Koloshian was creating a clinical testing lab on campus. And last week, we heard from Dr. Rong Hai and Dr. Juliet Morrison, who gave, both gave a talk on COVID vaccines and beyond. And today, I know that you're going to enjoy pr presentations by Professor Thomas Coleman and Professor Roy Zandi on understanding coronavirus assembly. So videos of each of the presentation will be available later at science lecture series, all one word, .ucr.edu. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And at this point, I'll turn it over to our CNAS Divisional Dean of Physical Sciences and Mathematics and Physics Professor, Dr. Jose Woodcock. Thank you, Dean Yurik, for the introduction. The ancient saying, know thy enemy, holds true, is true today as the world faces the deadly novel, uh, novel coronavirus. To understand how COVID-19 assembles itself into a viable virus, UC Riverside experts, professors Thomas Kuhlman and Roya Zandi will share with us how their research, experiments, and computer simulations, which have never before been performed on the coronavirus, and will help propel the development of drug therapies that slow or destroy the virus. Before we bring our guest speakers, I'd like to introduce Prof Professor Umar Mohideen, who will be moderating this evening's talk. Professor Mohideen is a distinguished professor of physics at the UCR Department of Physics and Astronomy. He is past chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy and past divisional dean for the physical and mathematical sciences at CNAS. Professor Mohideen earned his PhD in physics from Columbia University and his postdoctoral fellowship at the AT&T Bell Lab in Murray Hills, New Jersey, before joining UCR. His research involves precision forces, measurements, and particularly the Casimir force in fundamental physics, and also single molecule interaction forces between proteins, all of which topics incidentally merit their own science lecture series. Professor Mohideen is a co-principal investigator with Professor Zandi on a coronavirus research grant that was funded by the National Science Foundation. His work on using experimental single molecule sensitivity techniques contributes to the understanding of the coronavirus assembly. Welcome to the Science Lecture Series, Professor Mohideen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Woodka, for that introduction. Uh, indeed, as you said, uh, working with uh, Professor Zandi and Professor Coleman this year on the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus and its assembly has been one of the most exciting things that happened. Without much ado, I wanna introduce our speakers today with Professor Zandi. Professor Zandi received her PhD from the Department of Physics at UCLA. Prior to joining the faculty at UC Riverside, she did a postgraduate work in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UCLA and in the Department of Physics at MIT. Dr. Zandi's research is in the field of statistical mechanics and soft condensed matter physics, which has given her the opportunity to work in broad interdisciplinary areas. She has conducted research in statistical mechanics of both neutral and charged polymers, the dynamics of the passage of polymers through membrane pores, knot theory, and Casimir force physics. 
Her most recent research focuses on the physics of viruses, which has been continuously funded by the National Science Foundation and will be the subject of some of the talk today. Our other presented today is Professor Thomas Kuhlman, who received his PhD from the Department of Physics at UC San Diego. He performed his postdoctoral training in the Department of Molecular Biology at Princeton University, and then joined the faculty of the Department of Physics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He joined the faculty of physics at UC Riverside in 2018. Professor Kuhlman's work focuses on gene regulation, evolution, and genome dynamics, synthetic biology, and bioengineering and is now applying his experimental techniques to the study of the assembly of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Roy and Tom, take it away. Okay. And um, thank you, Dr. Mohiuddin, for the introduction. So I guess now I can sh start sharing my um, my slides. Hold on. All right. Okay. Thank you for coming to uh, to the last series of the talk. Um, um, I hope there are many parents in the audience. Um, I would like to tell you a story. Um, the story is about um, Isador, um, Isaac Rabi, the Nobel Prize winner in physics in 1944. Um, Rabi uh, won his Nobel Prize for his discovery that contributed to the construction of formation of um, uh, construction of MRI machine. Um, MRI is an imaging technique um, that is used extensively in medicine and saves many lives um, each year. But I like to share the story um, about his path about, um, uh, be to become a scientist. In fact, once someone asked him, why did you become a physicist? And this is his answer. My mother made me a scientist. And of course, as a mother, I love this answer. So he said that, let's see, I have to change here. He said that because every day after school, my mom asked, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? So my emphasis is on asking a good question. So according to Izzy, this made a big difference. Um, so asking good question made him into a scientist. So today I would like to tell you that um, as physicists, what kind of question we ask about coronaviruses, how we want to understand them, and how we, what kind of tools we use to address those questions. Okay, so I am a physicist. So first we simplify everything. So therefore we can understand them uh, from a very, very fundamental point of view. So what is a virus? Virus is made of a genome, which can be RNA or DNA, and a protein shell called the capsid. Um, the capsid protects the genome against harsh environment when the virus travels uh, outside the cell. I want to emphasize that it's the genome that has the information and the code for reproduction of the virus, for making new viruses. So why do we know so little about viruses? Because of their size, it, they are really small. So let's see how, when, as a physicist, when we say something is small, we have to say it's a small compared to what? This is a human hair strength. And here we have 50 bacteria that within the thickness of the hair strand, you can line up 50 bacteria. Along each bacteria, you can fit 10 coronaviruses. 
So it means that within the thickness of each hair strand, you can fit 500 coronaviruses. So one coronavirus is equal to one over 500 thickness of a hair strand. So you can see how small these viruses are, and that's why it's so hard to see how they assemble, how they form, and to learn it, and to learn the kinetic pathways or many questions that you might have about these viruses. This is the life cycle of a coronavirus, and I would like to put the life in the quotation mark because, and I will discuss it later if we have time, what we mean by life. So, but the virus get attracted to the cell membrane. This interaction often is electrostatic. And when I say electrostatic, I mean that there are positive charges and negative charges that attract each other. And that's why the virus gets attracted uh, to the cell membrane. So you can see there is no head, there is no brain. These are just um, uh, um, interactions between two objects. Then the virus disassembles. There, we don't still know exactly how it does, but it disassembles. And then releases its genome. And it's the genome that has the code for formation of more genome, so it makes more genome, and also it makes proteins that the, at the end, they're gonna make the coronavirus, the envelope of the coronavirus. So here is the protein of the coronavirus that end up to be in the envelope. And I wanna tell you that the genome of the coronavirus is pretty long, actually among all coronaviruses, among actually all, all RNA viruses, coronavirus has the largest genome. I mean, the genome of the coronavirus, if you stretch it, is 10,000 nanometer, meaning that it's 100 times larger than the size of the virus. You have to put the virus 100 times next to each other, then you have the size of the RNA. So we need something to compactify this RNA so it can be fit inside the envelope of a virus. And this is what we call N protein. N protein, this is actually one of the area that, uh, one of the areas that we are doing research to understand how this RNA that is so long, it can be compactified and then go to a place in the cell I mean, we call it ERGIC, it doesn't matter, but I mean that the genome and all this protein goes here and then they take their membrane, it's, it's a greasy um, network, uh, um, a membrane inside the cell and get the membrane and then assemble, oops, sorry, and then assemble and then exit the cell. So viruses assemble, many RNA viruses assemble in vitro. And this is fascinating because imagine that we, we sit down together and we have Legos and we wanna make this shell because the, the shape of viruses is very regular and is very pretty. We have to sit down and think about it. We have to put each piece next to each other and think where to put next one. But viruses, they do this spontaneously. Actually, this is, these are magnets in a container and then they are cut such that their edge attract each other. And you can see that by shaking the container, which is equivalent of the temperature, when proteins are in a solution, you can get the shell. Exactly the same thing is a happen in viruses. So, RNA viruses can assemble spontaneously in the test tube. So this is the virus. If you change the ionic strength, meaning if you add more salt, the virus disassembled, completely falls apart. And then the, the genome is negatively charged and the proteins are positively charged. 
And we know that the opposites attract, so the genome and protein attract each other. But the condition should be perfect for that. So therefore, if we change this the, back the condition back to the original one, these virus, these um, proteins attract the genome because it's negatively charged and positive charge and opposites attract. The protein also, they attract each other. And you can think about the interaction between proteins like the droplets of oil um, in a water pan. If you shake it, if there are small droplets of oil, if you shake it, the droplet of oil, they join each other and make it larger and larger oil droplets. So it's the same thing. It's, the, it's called hydrophobic interaction. So therefore, inside the solution, in a test tube, a virus assembles spontaneously and form a f and, and fully infectious viruses form. And amazing enough, this is common among many viruses. So the shape that I showed you in the previous slide, actually, this, is, this has what we call icosahedral symmetry. I tell you what I mean immediately. Uh, I mean that this, uh, this shape have the symmetry of a soccer ball. They look like soccer ball. So these pictures, these are, um, they, they have, um, uh, so this is herpes. This is a, a virus that infect human. We have many other viruses here. Some of these viruses infect um, plants. Some of them infect uh, bacteria. But there is one thing, and some of them have DNA as a, a genome. Some of them have RNA as a genome. And the proteins of these shells uh, are different. But there is one thing common among them, and that's icosahedral symmetry. So as a physicist, we want to know why. What is it that is universal among all of them? What is the common feature among them? How can we make uh, structures? How can we make protein subunits that at the end we get these stable, beautiful shells? And they are very stable. So, as a physicist, again, we like to learn about forces and interactions. So when we think about viruses, we think about universality and interaction. Actually, you might hear the story about uh, Newton when he was sitting under uh, an apple tree. And um, when the apple, uh, I mean, this is a story, I don't know if it's correct or not, but then when the apple fell down, he wondered why the apple didn't go upward, why it, it came down, what is the interaction between the earth and the apple? And that, uh, that questions, that set of questions ended up uh, for him to discover the universal law of gravitational forces. We are looking for the same thing. We are looking for understand what is it about these proteins that make such a beautiful stable shells. Proteins are physical objects. They can be stretched, they can be um, compressed. Uh, we want to model them and look at the growth of the shell. And we know that there is a preferred angle between them. I am not going, this is, I just want to give you a flavor of what we are doing. I'm not going to go through all the, all the formulas. Uh, as a matter of fact, I should tell you I am a theoretical physicist. So my tool is math and computer simulations. Next talk, my, uh, my colleague, um, Professor uh, Kuhlman, he will talk to you about the, uh, about the experiments that we are doing. But here I use the theory of elasticity and try to understand what can I do to form a virus. These are my former group members. Um, um, two of them graduated at UCR and also um, 
another group member who is now a professor. So he made, actually Jeff made these uh, simulations. So this protein, these uh, uh, subunits that we model, they are interacting with each other. So we tried our best to mimic the same interaction that the proteins they have with each other. And then we, our question was that, could we reproduce what the, what the uh, uh, viruses do spontaneous in the shell? As I said, making this, even if we use our head and start thinking, is not easy. And then the viruses do that. So uh, with Jeff, we were trying to see what kind of interaction we can put. And we were luckily, uh, we found um, what is needed to make these shells so stable. But Corona is a way more complex virus. As I told you, you know, it has this membrane, the greasy uh, material that it steals when it's budding for, um, in, uh, inside the cell. And so, and it gets its, uh, it gets its greasy coat during budding. So it's way more complex. And we just started doing simulations and try to understand it. And I told you the genome of corona is the largest one among RNA viruses. So grabbing this genome and bending the membrane and budding is really challenging to understand. So these are my current group members, uh, Sanaz and Inan and, and Kevin was a former student in the math department that we started understanding budding together. Now for this movie, imagine that this is the, the genome that has been condensed because of the N proteins, as I told you. N proteins are positively charged and RNA is negatively charged. And it is this interaction that make it compactify the genome. And this a network that you see, it is, um, it is the membrane. That's how we model it. By the way, this movie has been um, shown, uh, this, uh, this work has been featured in New York Times. So I want to show you that how the genome that is condensed, that is compactified because of interaction with another protein, starts to attract the membrane and the membrane starts wrapping around it and the, the genome buds off the membrane. The important question is that how does the genome bend the membrane and how does it leave the membrane? So how could we, and if we understand it, hopefully we can one day stop it, but we are far from there, but we have started um, to understand many aspects of it. So coronaviruses, they are pretty. So I have been showing you a whole bunch of pretty pictures. Viruses are in general pretty. They are simple, they assemble spontaneously RNA viruses, and when they assemble, they make a very, very nice shape. But they are deadly. And I should tell you that there are more than 500 coronaviruses have been identified in bats. And the chances that another coronavirus jump into human, it's very high, it's unavoidable. But it should not be um, devastating again. So we should be ready for it. The last two times for the pandemic that we had pandemic, uh, we had actually, it wasn't pandemic, it was epidemic. It, it didn't become that large. Um, the research stopped after the epidemic stop. This time, scientists, they are not going to stop. We keep learning about them, and we want to understand them better. So therefore, there won't be any devastation um, in the future. We will know how to deal with them. OK, this concludes uh, my presentation. And now my colleague start talking, uh, Dr. Kuhlman, and start uh, telling you about the method and his tools about understanding viruses and collaboration in science is very important. And I feel lucky that I have had many great students and collaborators at UCR helping us 
to understand and fight with this virus. So now I give it to Tom, Dr. Kulman. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, let me see if I can share my screen. Expected. There it is. All right, next one. Okay, hi everybody, and uh, thank you, Professor Zandi, for the beautiful talk and the introduction. And so, as she mentioned, I'm an experimentalist, and so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about how we know this particular virus is put together and generally outline the kinds of experiments that we have planned to try to probe this thing to see if we can understand in more detail exactly how it uh, assembles itself. Okay, so um, on the left, what you see, oh, excuse me, on the left, what you see is as close to an actual picture of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus as we're going to get. So it's a special kind of image called an electron micrograph, which I'll talk more about later. And uh, you can, so this is the thing that has now had us all locked in our homes for a year now. And so you can see that it uh, earns its name. It looks like a, a, a poorly drawn cartoon crown with all these little uh, 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 spikes sticking out uh, around it. And so uh, just looking at this image, it's a, it's a little bit of a mess. And so on the right, what you see over here is a computer representation of what we would expect the virus to actually look like if we could you know, see it with essentially infinite resolution. So if we could see it you know, down to the atom, uh, uh, what you see on the right is, is a pretty good representation of what we believe it would look like. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time telling you about what each one of these parts are that you see on this thing, okay? And so inside the virus, is, as uh, Professor Zandi mentioned, is the RNA molecule that makes up the virus's genome. And this molecule, again, as she mentioned, contains all of the instructions that are required for the virus to, uh, to be able to make copies of itself inside of its host cell. Okay, wrapped around that uh, genomic RNA is uh, the greasy membrane, uh, and the virus actually steals this membrane from its host cell as it assembles itself and, and uh, begins to exit. So this uh, outer shell is made out of material that the virus has actually taken from, from, its, uh, from the cell that it came from. Okay, the, the Spikes on the outside that make it look like a, a crown, those are appropriately enough referred to as the spike or S protein. And it's these proteins which actually interact with the uh, receptors on the surface of our cells in order to actually gain entry into the cell. And I believe it's actually this protein which the majority of the uh, vaccines and, and treatments are, are targeted towards specifically this protein. Uh, because it needs this protein in order to be able to uh, attack and invade our cell. Embedded in the greasy membrane is another protein called the membrane or M protein. And so this membrane protein actually is able to interact with all of the other proteins. So it interacts with the spike protein, it interacts with the other proteins that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. And so it, we believe, plays a, a fairly central role in mediating all the interactions between the different players and determining essentially what the shape and, and size of the virus is going to be. Okay, inside the uh, uh, membrane of the virus, you see the genomic RNA is bound to and protected by uh, another protein that's referred to as the N or nucleocapsid protein. And so again, as Professor Zandi mentioned, we believe that this protein plays a fairly important role in essentially compactifying this big, long, uh, huge RNA molecule such that it can fit inside this tiny little virus. Okay, and then the final protein that we're interested in is something called the envelope or E protein. 
And so now it turns out that uh, a little bit less is known about this thing. So it's my understanding that we actually don't entirely know exactly what this protein does, but uh, we believe it plays some important role in um, uh, 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 determining the correct shape of the virus as it prepares to, to exit the cell. It has some other really interesting properties, like it also serves as an ion channel. It allows charged molecules to fly, uh, come in and out of the viral uh, uh, protein. But again, I think our understanding of exactly what it's doing is uh, uh, not as good as the other ones. Okay, so these six components are the uh, some of the primary uh, uh, players in determining the structure of the virus itself. The virus encodes many other proteins, but we're primarily interested in these six players and how they interact with one another to assemble the virus into a complete and infectious particle. Okay, so now uh, again, let me really quickly uh, refresh your memories as to how the virus attacks the cell and, and makes copies of itself and what we already know about how the thing assembles itself. Okay, so here what you see is a representation of the cell. So the pink here is meant to represent the interior of the cell and the white is the exterior of the cell. And so what happens is that the cell gets exposed to these coronavirus particles and the coronavirus actually uh, binds to uh, these receptor proteins that are on the surface of many of our cells that actually, I mean, they're there for other purposes. So I believe the one that the coronavirus uses is actually involved in regulating our blood pressure of all things, okay? But the coronavirus takes advantage of the presence of this protein and binds to it. And upon binding to that protein, it's then brought inside the cell where it's taken apart and the genomic information released. And at this point, the virus essentially hijacks our cells and takes control of all of its machinery and uses the cell to begin replicating copies of itself. So it, comp it makes copies of its genome and it uses the cellular machinery to start producing these proteins that we discussed on the previous slide. Okay, these proteins then begin to uh, collect and uh, insert themselves into membranes that are inside of the cell. And those also begin to associate with this, uh, with the genome, which has already begun uh, binding to the end protein in order to get it into a configuration that's actually able to fit into the, the assembling virus. Okay, it then begins a, a budding process and is encapsulated in what's referred to as a vesicle. It's essentially just a bubble inside the cell, which is then trafficked throughout the cell until it eventually reaches the surface and is uh, released into the environment in order to repeat this process over again. Okay, so this is the process that we're interested in studying, right? So, I mean, it's, it's this process that's going on inside of infected cells that uh, is the assembly of this virus, and that's, that's really what we're interested in. And so now it turns out that there's actually quite a few questions about this that remain fairly unclear. All right, so for example, out of all the proteins that I listed on the previous slide, the S, E, M, and N, it's actually not known which set of those proteins is actually required for this thing to assemble itself, okay? So for example, if you remove the E protein, uh, would the virus still be able to assemble, or the M protein, or the S protein, okay? So it's actually not known what the essentially minimum set of proteins is that is required for this thing to complete the assembly process to form an infectious virus. It's also not really known, uh, uh, essentially, how, how does this process happen in time? How quickly does it happen? So when the, when, it become, when the virus gets taken in and it disassembles and starts making all these parts, what, you know, how long does, does each of these steps take? Once all these things are produced, how are they then trafficked throughout the cell and, and moved around so that they're uh, uh, able to exit and get out and repeat this process? And again, this is very, very poorly understood. And so the goal of our uh, uh, collaboration that we've put together here to study the coronavirus is to understand this assembly process in uh, detail so we know exactly what's going on. We know exactly which proteins are involved, and we understand the interactions between them that are necessary for the virus to assemble itself. 
And then the ultimate goal is once we understand this in detail, then we would have a better idea essentially of how to break it, right? Once you, once you know how something works, then you know how to screw it up, right? So the goal is to use our understanding gained through experiments and modeled using Professor Zandi's theory to hopefully uh, have a better route to predict uh, various kinds of treatments that we can use to uh, target these drugs with our or target the viruses with our collaborators in the medical school. Okay, so now uh, uh, that's, that's our goal. That's what we wanna do. And so now let me give you some flavor as to how it is that we're gonna go about doing this. Okay, so again, what we wanna do is to watch these viruses get inside cells uh, and then assemble themselves and come out. And we wanna measure all the interactions and how many proteins are there and where are they and exactly what are they doing inside the cell. So to do this, one of the things we need to be able to do is to grow cells so that we can watch them. All right, and so one technique that we plan on using to do this is what's referred to as a, a microfluidic growth chamber. Okay, and so I, act I actually have one right here if you can see it. It's a little hard to see because it's clear glass, but just to give you some sense of the scale of this thing. And so it's essentially just a piece of plastic on a microscope slide. And into that plastic, we can pattern various things like channels and chambers and valves and so forth, okay? So what we do is we, we make these little chambers out of this plastic. We then hook them up to these hoses, which allow us to flow various fluids into the chamber. And then we can use these devices to very precisely control how the cells grow, okay? So here's an example on the right of uh, what you see here is a microfluidic gro growth chamber. And you can imagine that you would put, for example, a cell here in the middle of this chamber. And then what you can do is uh, uh, flow in various chemicals. So what they're showing here are various dyes that uh, uh, can represent various chemicals that you can imagine subjecting the cells to. And so you can see that we have very precise control over you know, what we're feeding to the cells at any given time. And we can therefore measure how they respond. Okay, another technique we plan on using is a, a microscopy. So this you see here is the microscope in my lab and these things on top are the, the pumps for running the microfluidics. And uh, so this is what we use to watch the cells, right? So we put the cells in these chambers, we put it on the microscope and you see images that look like this. Okay, so the problem is this is a big mess, right? I mean, you can't really tell what's going on here. So ideally, what you would have is the things that you're interested in, well, ideally, they would just uh, light up, right? So if I wanted to see S protein, well, it would be really great if it was just a big green spot, or an E protein is a big red spot, or an N protein is a blue spot, so on and so forth. And so it turns out that we can do exactly this. We can take all of these components that we're interested in, and tag them with a bright fluorescent uh, 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 chemical, which allows us to see uh, 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 essentially where things are in the cell, how much of them there is, and how they move around and assemble uh, 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 throughout the, the growth process. So whenever you see beautiful images like this, that's what you're seeing. These various components of the cell are tagged with different colors, fluorescent uh, 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 dyes, which then allow us to identify what those components are and where they are in the cell and, and what they're doing. Okay, and finally, uh, as Roy mentioned, viruses are really tiny. In fact, they're so tiny that you cannot look at them with light. It's impossible. Okay, and so we need a different tool to look at viruses directly, and that is a, an electron microscope. So instead of shooting light at the viruses, we shoot electrons at them. And that allows us to take very highly detailed pictures of, of these things, okay? And so again, one of our collaborators is an expert electron microscopist. And here's an example of a, 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 an electron micrograph of a cell that he has producing these uh, coronavirus proteins. And again, it looks kind of like a mess, but if you look really closely, you can see these circular objects which we think at this point represent uh, uh, assembled viral particles, which we plan to collect and then further characterize. 
Okay, so with that, I would like to wrap up and uh, just outline essentially what our goals are. So we plan to look at how the coronavirus assembles itself in live cells, or what we refer to as in vivo, using combinations of things like fluorescence and electron microscopy. We have other people in our team who are experts at manipulating these things in a test tube. So someone like uh, Professor Mo Mohadeen, is an ex he, he would be doing experiments where you just take the proteins, throw them in a tube, and then see whether or not they can assemble themselves and measure that process. Okay, and then using the information that we gain from these experiments, we want to feed that information to Professor Zandi so that she can use it to uh, uh, do some modeling to hopefully help us predict and drugs that we can test whether or not they influence this assembly process. And with that, I would like to conclude and uh, here are all the people uh, that are in our collaboration uh, to, to look at this project. And I, I'll simply stop here and be happy to take whatever question you might have. Okay. So now I probably stop share. There we go. Okay, um, prof thank you, Professor Kuhlman and Professor Zandi. That was just such an excellent introduction uh, and a view of your, the research program that you have ongoing. Now, I'd like to open it up to the audience and um, uh, uh, to ask some questions and Professor Dean Woodka would be moderating the uh, questions. So I would like to invite him to uh, uh, you know, start with that. Thank you, Professor Mogadini. Uh, we also have questions from our si uh, CNAS science ambassadors. In fact, let me take one from them first. This is from Andrew Armendi, who is interested in insect endocrinology and plans on pursuing his master's degree or PhD. Andrew, please go ahead, ask your question. Hi there. Once again, I'm Andrew Armeni. I'm a fifth year biochemistry and entomology double major. My question is regarding um, what are some of the common human behaviors and traits that allow the virus to be more easily replicated in the human body? Tom, do you go for it? Uh, sure. So I guess I would say that it's certainly true that it seems that some people are more susceptible to, uh, you know, the ill effects of the viral re replication than others. I mean, some people get more sick or more ill than others. But I think it's still a pretty intense subject as, of research as to exactly what those factors are that make one person uh, more susceptible than the other. Uh, so exactly like what the molecular details are that allow that enhance or reduce replication in individual cells, I think is still a pretty outstanding question. Uh, now, the, of course, there are other, you know, social behaviors like, you know, humans in general want to get together and talk to each other. And these behaviors uh, unfortunately have a tendency to, to spread the thing pretty, pretty drastically as, as we've seen. So... All right. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Coleman. Here's a question from the audience, and I think probably uh, meant for uh, Professor Zandi because she introduced the topic in her, um, uh, during her talk. This concerns the fact, are viruses alive? Are they animals? Or what are they? How would you classify them? Right. Thank you. Um, this is the question that I get a lot, and it's. I think that it's a hard. It's a very hard question, um, because um, so they do not need oxygen. They do not breathe. They do not. They don't need food. They don't have. Um, they don't metabolize food. So the thing about them is that they reproduce. They have the code. Um, that as soon as they get into the cell, they take over our cell machinery and uses to reproduce. So depending on what you call life, 
you can, so this is a very philosophical question. So it depends on the definition of life. So yes, when they are inside ourselves, they are alive, they have the code to reproduce. But outside of ourselves, these are just like a grain and, and they are nothing more than um, a grain. So this is, this is a philosophical question, but I think that it's different from a stone. So they have the code to reproduce. So in a way you can think of it as a life. Thank, thank you, Professor Zandi. It's, yeah, well, I, uh, I guess it's a question that'll, that will be, um, take a while to digest. <laughs> I guess we're alternating between audience and student questions. So let me direct the second uh, student that we have here. I've selected Daniel Dorantes. Daniel is, a graduate, uh, is graduating in June, congratulations, and will be pursuing his PhD in mathematics at USC in the fall of 2021. Daniel, please, your question. Um, my name is Daniel Dorantes. I'm a fourth year here at UCR. I'm a pure mathematics major. And um, following up on the question that was just asked, uh, Dr. Zandi, you said that these, uh, these viruses don't have any head, they don't have any brain. How is it that they manage to know to target certain parts of the body, such as the lung for coronavirus? Very good question. It's all physical interactions. So, and it's some, let's say because of their shape and interaction. So, um, so the spike protein that they talked last week is like a key. So therefore, those spike proteins, they have the key, and that key fits only certain um, cells. So the spike protein of coronavirus fit the key for lung viruses. So those are spike, so even they circulate inside the body, they cannot get into any cell they encounter. They, uh, they, they go to the cell where their spike protein the interaction between the stock protein and the receptors on the cell fit. There is electrostatic probably interaction. There might be some hydrophobic interaction involved. They attract. And because the key matches the receptor, then um, they fit and then the, the cell starts the process of engulfing the virus or other mechanism for taking it inside. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Umar. Uh, th th thank you, Dean Wilka. Uh, so uh, the question, uh, this is another popular question here on the message board. And so uh, Professor Zandi and Professor Kuhlman told us that there are 500 different species of viruses. And how, they want to know how many gene sequences have to be changed to make a different species. Uh, I don't know, is it Professor Kuhlman? Do you want to try and answer? So I think that is an extraordinarily difficult question. I mean, e even just defining what a species is, you know, what separates one species from another is an extremely complicated question. So uh, I, I am sure there's no set number of genes that, that you would need to mutate before you would consider it a separate species. Uh, I don't know, Professor Zandi, do you have anything to add? I think it's a super hard question. Yeah, I agree. I heard about this actually about the molecular biologist at uh, giving a talk on coronaviruses at Berkeley. Um, she has obviously a different point of view, but that's what I heard that there are um, actually more than 500 uh, species of coronaviruses in bat that they have identified. And they think that if you, uh, you consider the statistics and everything else, there are about 5,000 different uh, coronaviruses around. But, but um, this, is, this is not what I can answer. I mean, I agree with Tom, this is a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Zandi and Professor Cohen. Um, let me go to a question from Patricia Sanchez. Patricia will be joining the Wilson Rankin Lab this summer. She'll be studying the host competency of Western Yellow Jackets in Crithidia. Patricia, please, your question. Hi there, doctors. Um, my name is Patricia B. Sanchez, and I am a second year biology major here at UCR. Um, earlier, Dr. Zandi was talking about how the virus was able to spontaneously disassemble and reassemble depending on the pH. Um, 
does anyone have a stronger understanding of how it's able to survive a higher pH within the human body where it usually disassembles? Okay, that, that virus that I showed actually was, uh, the condition was a, for a plant virus. It was not for a human virus. So the viruses that survive in, in our body, actually they are, um, they are, they are uh, adapted so that they assemble uh, under the condition, the appropriate condition that it is inside our cell. So that's why they can assemble a, um, in the, with higher pH. Thank you, Patricia. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dean Woodka. So here's a popular question um, that I'm seeing on the message board. Uh, I'm gonna combine two of them, okay? And it's about the spike protein, uh, you know, uh, what role, exact role does it play and why does it target the lungs? Perhaps uh, Professor Kuhlman can try to answer. Ah, so the exact role it plays, it's the protein which actually is responsible for initially binding to uh, the, the cell. So, so when the virus gets inside your body and it wants to uh, attack and invade your cells, that, that's the protein which does this initial uh, binding and, and uh, uh, step in order for it to be taken in. Uh, so now as to why it uh, goes after the lungs, I think the simplest answer is that that's simply where it gets to first. So when you breathe it in, uh, you know, you're breathing in air that contains these viral particles and it just, you know, it collects in your lungs. And so that's the cells that they get exposed to first. But there's actually a variety of cells which express the surface receptor protein that's necessary for uh, the binding and invasion of the coronavirus. And in fact, I think there's quite a bit of research which shows that uh, the coronavirus can actually, you know, invade and attack these different cell types. So it's entirely, well, I, I don't want to say entirely, I don't want to say anything absolute, but I think it's primarily a consequence of that's just where it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Coleman. Yes. We have uh, another uh, student question from Jose Soto. Uh, Jose is doing research at UCR now with uh, Dr. Professor Maduro, uh, studying the metabolism of C. elegans. And Jose is graduating this year, congratulations, and will be pursuing his PhD in cell, development by cell developmental biology at UCLA. Jose, please, your question. Hi, on the topic of, uh, you know, all the species of coronavirus out there, what is it about, you know, the, uh, this SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that uh, made it special and why we're worrying about it now, even to today? And um, is it a bigger issue than studying other viruses? Tom, perhaps? Uh, well, so, um, I mean, there have, there have been epidemics previously of similar viruses. So if you remember the, the SARS uh, epidemic a few years ago, and then there was another one called MERS in the Middle East. So those, those were related viruses. And um, I believe those, those were, I mean, they, so they had very similar properties. And in fact, the diseases that they caused were also quite severe. But I don't, so the current pandemic virus, I believe, is actually probably not quite as severe as those other two and is more highly contagious. And I think those factors combined together has been what has allowed it to, to spread so, so widely. But I don't know, Professor Zandi, maybe you have other insights. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. It's, it is, it is, I mean, it's, um, and I, I think it's our lifestyle is also is changed compared to many years ago and then flying and and I heard a lot of things about it um, from um, virologists and uh, but you know I think this is still under um, under uh, intense research so I'm not I cannot add m much more than what uh, Tom said. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, we have one, another popular audience question, and this concerns about, they said when the, when the virus exits a cell, 
does it break the cell wall or lice the cell wall? Actually, the audience member used the word lice, lice the cell wall. I don't know, Professor Zandi, perhaps you can uh, take the question. Yeah, no, this virus doesn't lice the cell. The, the lysing happens when um, the, the cell makes a lot of viruses and then the, vi then the cell bursts. So this virus actually goes through exocytosis, similar to the shape that we showed. So the virus gets towards the membrane and then and wraps around, and the membrane wraps around it and then it goes out. The same, I mean, Still, they are not sure how coronaviruses gets into the cell. Um, some studies shows that it goes through what is called endocytosis. The membrane wrap around the virus and takes it in. Some they think that the virus gets attached and the, it opens up a hole and the genome goes inside. There are still, um, hopefully, um, Dr. Kultzman uh, exper experiments help us to understand all these things better. Uh, but for exiting the cell, I think there is a, a consensus that it goes to the cell and it goes through a process that is called exocytosis. There is no lysing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zandi. Uh, Pastor Dean Woodka, in case the student or pastors have some questions. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. In fact, we have run out of time. Uh, for, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm especially sorry because there's so many questions that everybody would like to know the answers to. Um, with this, I'd like to uh, just tell you we've come to the end of today's talk, discussion and understanding coronavirus assembly, and also to the conclusion of the 2021 science lecture series. Videos of all the science lecture series talks will be posted on our website, which is science lecture series, all one word, dot ucredu and our social media pages on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at UCRCNAS, UCRCNAS, all one word. I want to thank you again, Professors Mongdean, Professor Kuhlman, Professor Zandi, for your excellent talk and your very informative and exciting research. I also want to thank our students and all of you for being here this evening. And before I close, I want to invite you all to the next year's series, which hopefully will be held in person. Have all a good evening. Thank you.